First off, before I start this review, this is absolute spoilers for episode two and the preview for episode three. So if you haven't seen either one, who are we kidding? You've been absolutely spoiled by now by some jackass at work or the internet. I'm really sorry. I thought this was a fantastic episode even before the end scene. So I'm just not hyping up this episode because I'm a Jon Snow fanatic and I'm so happy that he's back. I have written proof that I like this episode before that end scene. And yes, I may have lost my shit when he came back. And yes, I may have almost vomited from excitement for the very first time in my life. But I swears to you, I liked other things too. So let's start with Jon Snow and the wall because I can't contain myself. And then I swears I will talk about other characters and scenes. Though the wildlings didn't really fight that much, it was still awesome to see. I heard the pounding and instantly yelled, 1-1! One, one! I liked the one guy that tried to attack him, and 1-1 one, one put him down for a little nap. What I didn't like here, I get why Thorne is getting bitchy about the wildlings, and I also know why Ollie ran at them and attacked them. But it was done in such a way that it was almost overdone. How they dragged off Thorn and Ollie like two villains, we get it. We should dislike Ollie. It just seemed so comical. Thorn being dragged off and then Ollie being dragged off as well. Just those two. Like, Ollie was a huge mastermind along with Thorn. They were like two buddies. He was like his sidekick. I, I just feel like in episode three, we're gonna show Ollie with a Hitler mustache or something. That's how kind of overboard it's starting to feel. Also, that scene when they were outside the room where John's body is, not sure if I would have picked Ollie to be part of the men storming into that room. He's kind of little, and the people in that room are kind of big. I just feel like Ollie's not the first person I would pick for my team. He's probably the last person I'd pick. I would probably give him a, a bow and arrow or maybe a crossbow and be like, hey, buddy, there are grown adults in that room. You are not a grown adult. You are going to get slaughtered. Take this crossbow, take this bow and arrow, just chill right there. If any of them try to escape, you can just kill them. All right? All right. But I get that Ollie is loyal to Thorne, and that was probably the reason why they had Ollie with him, but it still seemed like a really terrible matchup. And Ollie was like gunning for it. He was he was standing there just just ready to go in. Boy, you would have been squished in a second. I'm so happy Melisandre brought up Thoros this episode and we saw all her doubt. I have to believe they were really trying to draw those parallels between Thoros being at his lowest with so little faith and bringing his friend back and Mel being in the same position. She is freezing, something we've never seen before. Melisandre having to bundle up and sit by the fire. And Davos was as heartwarming as ever. I'm not asking some god to bring him back. I'm asking a woman that showed me miracles exist. Her slight smile in response to was just, aw. But let's get to the actual ritual. I thought for sure that it was going to fail. I thought, no way is Jon Snow coming back in episode two. They're gonna show it fail. He's gonna maybe come back in episode three, especially with Kit Harington, that freaking goddamn liar, Kit Harington. We will never trust you again. And I know you had an apology that you sent out after this episode aired saying you were sorry about lying. And I realized that you couldn't just go around in interviews saying that, yeah, you come back to life, but still you wounded us, sir. You wounded us. But during the ritual, and I don't know if anyone else was thinking this, I was looking at his body as Melisandre was cleaning it thinking, wow, you should uh, maybe stitch up those big holes in his body before you bring him back. You know, the things where fluids leak out of and you die? Those things? Maybe close them up? Stitches? Some band-aids? Kisses to make it better? Oh my god, episode three. Jon Snow sits up. All of a sudden, all his wounds start bleeding again. He bleeds out instantly and dies. No one knows, because they're not in the room. The next day, they come back in. Jon Snow's still dead. d and I swear to god. If that is your plan, I want you to know that everything they say about redheads and their ability to hold grudges and get revenge is absolutely true. Times ten. I've killed for less. Not really, though. FBI, if you're watching this. So our lord and savior has come back. But I have a few questions. One, has death changed him at all? We know that every time Barrett came back, he lost more and more of himself. Like, little pieces of himself 
were being chipped away. With John, it, it's a little bit different. He wasn't brought back instantly like Barrack was most times, and he wasn't in a river floating around for a while like somebody else. This is also John's first res. So we kind of have no idea how this is going to affect him. John definitely is done with the wall, no way he stays, and we also have that backed up by the trailer released by HBO that they mysteriously took down from their YouTube page. In it, I pointed out that you could see John riding into battle. Others probably noticed this as well, so I'm guessing that's why they took down the trailer. So that's another point for John most likely isn't staying at the wall. Technically, he is released from his vows because he died. I'm guessing that Ed is going to take over as Lord Commander. They've made a big show of it so far, mentioning him and seeing him lead. John would most likely give Ed his blessing to take over. I don't know if they're going to be traditional and have a vote because some very untraditional things have been happening at the wall lately. So John and Davos are most likely going to take the Wildlings to Winterfell. And then something terrible might happen because this is Game of Thrones, not a fairy tale, and I am deeply terrified because this episode, it seemed like the good guys kind of had a lot going for them. And that's always scary in this world. But for now, we have Jon back, and I am going to be happy about that. It also means that Tormund saying in the trailer, I thought he was the one to lead us, I was wrong, is him referring to Mance like a lot of us believed. And he's now saying that to John, you know, I thought it was him, but it's actually you. I don't know how I feel about the idea that John was in Ghost the entire time. I think it would work in the books. I don't know if it will work in the show. Ghost did sense when John was back, though. I'd be very excited to hear John talking about his death and what he experienced, if anything. Next episode might confirm or disprove that theory, for the show at least. Winterfell, well, we knew Roose and Ramsay were on borrowed time and borrowed land. We still don't have an explanation for those hounds. The guy that reported to Roos and Ramsey said that no one that saw the scene came back to report, so they can only guess at what happened. So the case of the missing hounds is still on. Best explanation I've seen so far? Aliens. Aliens did it. I was very happy to see the Karstarks come into play. We heard casting for them, so that wasn't too surprising, but still great to see. Super excited to hear about the Umbers and Manderleys. Not really sure where they're going with that, but it did look as if the Umbers were fighting on the side of the Boltons. I really hope there's some double crossing going on here. I can understand the Karstarks staying on the Bolton side. They hate the Starks for Rob executing their father. But the Umbers and Manderleys, I'm not quite sure. It did look as if the Umbers were turning over Rickon in the next episode. So maybe they really are loyal? Which means I need to make a House Umber video stat but I still am crossing my fingers for the Manderleys and Wyman Manderley and some sort of speech that I won't say in this video. But you know what I'm talking about. You know it. When Roos was talking to Ramsay, it was as heartwarming as those two get. Act like a wild dog, you'll get put down like one. But you'll always be my firstborn son. I didn't think Ramsay would kill Roos right then. I was thinking, oh, yeah, he's gonna sneak in, maybe poison the kid. You know, babies die all the time as infants. Nope. And I kind of feel like Roos's death is being overshadowed by John coming back, and not enough people are gonna talk about how shocking this was. We knew eventually Ramsay would try to get rid of Roos, but I didn't think he was gonna make his play this episode. I do like the mirroring of what Roos did in the past to what Ramsay did this episode. Roos committed a grave sin in the eyes of the Seven Kingdoms. He betrayed his lord, and he helped orchestrate, even though he didn't technically break guest right himself, but he helped others orchestrate breaking guest right against his lord, which resulted in the death of his lord, his lord's wife, and his lord's unborn child. This episode, Ramsay committed a grave sin in the Seven Kingdoms, kinslaying, that resulted in the death of his lord, his lord's wife, and his lord's child, like father, like son. Kinslaying is just so in right now. That and stabbing people with knives. I've learned two major things about Westeros. One, don't go to weddings. Two, don't hug anyone. You have no idea when someone's just gonna shank you. Ben Ramsey summoned Walda and her baby. When they showed the fire next to him while they were outside together, I thought, oh my god, he's going to toss that baby into the fire after holding it. I'm not sure if being torn apart by dogs would be better or worse than fire. If anyone knows the answer to that, 
maybe you shouldn't share how you know that. After seeing these scenes, I absolutely believe Ramsay will be dead by the end of the season or be so out of power that it won't even matter. Like I said before, he's on borrowed time. Let's hope John finishes him. Speaking of killing, if you look at the past two episodes, or even four past episodes, I think, we've seen the death of a lot of non-background characters. That, that tally is getting pretty high. Bran and the cave. First, the fact they said Bran was not always going to be in that cave and would need Mira. Huge shock. I was under the impression Bran was being trained to replace Blood Raven. But now it appears that Blood Raven is teaching Bran how to use his abilities for him to go out and fight the war against the others. That is a game changer, if I do say so myself. Blood Raven's line, it is beautiful beneath the sea, but if you stay too long, you'll drown, was so beautifully said. And that's a warning we see over and over again for the warg ability. If you stay too long inside another living being, you're gonna lose yourself. You're, you're essentially going to, you're gonna drown. You might not be able to find your way out. And it's the same way with Weirwood.net. If you stay there long enough, you could lose yourself. You, you could drown in that and never find your way out. And I just think that was such a well said line and so just fantastically done. I was really impressed by that one line. Seeing Ned, Benjen, and Liana as kids was so adorable. The message that innocence and happiness doesn't last was being beaten into Bran's head. I did get a little teary-eyed when Ned said the same thing to Benjen that John had said when training his own men. Be shield up or I'll ring your head like a bell. Keep your shield up or I'll ring your head like a bell. The consistency there, yes, Ned trained John and John is now passing that on. There was definitely some onions in the room during that moment. I didn't like that Liana looked older than Ned and Benjen, as Ned is supposed to be about three years older than her, but sometimes girls look older and they shoot up faster than boys. I've seen a lot of young girls that look a lot older than boys their same age. I did like how they showcased her riding abilities. She was said to be half a horse, and they really did a good job making her similar to Arya. One of the first scenes we see Arya in, she's showing off. First scene we see Liana in, she's showing off. Both girls also don't dress like ladies are supposed to. The Hodor reveal was also great. Now I'm really curious to see what caused him to be the way he is now. And it goes without saying, even though I'm just about to say it, that I am super pumped for the Tower of Joy vision next episode. Marine, Tyrion's line, that's what I do, I drink and know things, was so fantastic, followed closely by his back and forth with Varys about how he knows that Varys thinks dwarf jokes, and then Tyrion saying that he's the dragon's friend. And Varys responds, do they know that? I think their dialogue was a lot better this episode than in episode one. It was okay in episode one. The dialogue in episode two, I think they absolutely nailed it and was so much better and I was a lot more impressed with it and laughed a lot more at Tyrion's lines like I used to in previous seasons. I just think it was one episode that was a bit off and I honestly, for me, feel like that was what they were going for to show that Tyrion still is finding his footing a little bit and now he's really starting to, to get into the groove. Tyrion terrified me with his dragon stunt. Book readers know what happens when you turn your back on a dragon. Never turn your back on a dragon. When Tyrion was talking to the one dragon and going to take the collar off, I kept thinking, Tyrion, no, no, Tyrion, watch your back. You cannot turn your back on a dragon. Tyrion, dear God, please no, please no. And then he got the collar off and turned around and the dragon was just like, hey, cool, you're our friend. Help take off my collar too. I, I swear I won't eat you. We're friends. Bro code. It's always about the bro code. Sometimes I wish I had a penis because the bro code just seems amazing. Then Tyrion got out of there as quickly as possible. That was a breathtaking scene and very well done. I'm sure for people that believe Tyrion has Targaryen blood in him, this was an exciting scene in a different way. Though there are other explanations for what happened, such as the dragons were very weakened and people have bonded with dragons that weren't Targaryens or had Valyrian blood before. Or maybe. Though the theory or what was spread by the Targaryens is that they had Targaryen or Valyrian blood in them from the honor of someone in their family sleeping with someone in their line. Whether that is true or not is up for debate. So whether Tyrion has Targaryen blood in him or not, whether that theory is given a little bit more weight based on this episode, we don't know. Like I said, it could have been the dragons were weakened, they hadn't been eating, Tyrion did approach them, dragons are intelligent. 
there could be a lot of things for why they didn't eat Tyrion. <laughs> Regardless of the Targaryen blood, that was most likely the best and most terrifying day of Tyrion's life. The showrunners throwing in the story of Tyrion wanting a dragon as a boy was so well placed and I was so grateful for them adding it in. Tyrion has this deep love for dragons and they have absolutely killed it every scene that involves him seeing or interacting with dragons. Every time Tyrion sees a dragon, it's his dream coming true. He never thought he'd see a living dragon, and touching one is a whole different ballgame. Next, King's Landing. Cersei has power. God help us all. Cersei has power again. Between Robert Strong and Tommen now back under her control, things are not looking good, especially when Cersei sends out Robert Strong to kill people that say awful things about her, which I'm sure the Master of Whisperers her good friend Kyburn probably told her about. However, the man that flashed his dick at Cersei and told her to suck him off was likely already on his hit list. When the Tyrell army shows up and if they get Marjorie free, it's gonna be chaos. The High Sparrow and Jaime, wow, I'm told I'm not allowed to speculate on facial expressions, but I like to live life on the edge, so I'm gonna do it anyways. That smirk the Sparrow had at the end after saying together they can take down an empire, yeah, there's a lot more going on with him. Cersei gave them too much power, and now they are infecting the entire city. That was such a smug look on his face of, you can't do anything. We're too powerful now. There's too many of us. We saw the Iron Islands again. Thank the Lord of Light, or Drowned God. Euron killing Balon was predictable from the trailers, but the scene was still fun. The actor for Euron has the right amount of crazy going on. His god line was a bit changed, but still gave us a peek into a manipulative, vicious man. And we got the tongue cutting out bit and the I needed silence wink. I was very happy with that. I am very, very excited for King's Moot. And I don't want to see any speculating in the comments below about Deepwood Mott and how the Glovers took it back and a man took out the Ironborn. And I don't want to hear any speculation about how we know that a certain man took Deepwood Mott in the books. And I also don't want to hear about how Brienne talked about how they've all made hard choices this episode, including herself, and how that may or may not be about an oath that she may or may not have kept. I don't want to hear any of it. The wound is too deep. We need to let this go. We need to grieve. Sansa, Brienne, Theon, and Pod. I was so relieved to hear Brienne telling Sansa about Arya, just to see Sansa so happy to hear about her sister. Not exactly thrilled that Theon is leaving them, but I do think that was the right move. He did a lot of awful things, and he still has a lot of redeeming to do. How he's going to do that on the Iron Islands? Well, we'll see. Theon and Sansa's hug? That's huge. He basically screwed over her family, and she still found it in her heart to forgive him. Well, he did help her escape Winterfell, too. There's been a lot of talk of Sansa taking over Lady Stoneheart's role, and I don't know if they're going there, but just because she can show forgiveness doesn't mean she can't be a little bit more cruel with others. I guess we'll see. Happy to see the progress with Arya. They're taking her back to the temple after what I'm assuming was a period of punishment and testing of her obedience, and if you want to learn more about that stuff, you can check out my House of Black and White Part 3. Shameless plug, I'm so sorry. So now we don't get any more of seeing Arya getting the shit beaten out of her in the streets. Now we get to see Arya getting the shit beaten out of her in a temple. So this episode was entitled Home. Theon is going home, Euron came home, Jon came home, or to his body. Arya is invited back into the home of the many-faced god's servants. Bran went home in a vision. Cersei is back home with power. Sansa is at home with her new friends. I don't know, I'm really reaching at this point. What did you think of the episode? Did you scream when Jon came back? For book readers, this has been half a decade. I know George says the show is in the books, but right now, for this, I'm making this canon in my head that he comes back in the books. But what was your favorite part? Least favorite part? And before I bring this video to a close, I just want to thank all the show watchers who stood by me to the very end, who boarded that Jon Snow hype train and rode it with me all the way to the end. Here's to us. And to you naysayers, to those of you that doubted me, to those of you that said that you hope Jon Snow doesn't come back this season so you can see me throw a temper tantrum like a spoiled brat, I have this to say to you. From the bottom of my heart, I am 
truly sorry that your wish didn't come true. Thank you for watching. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up. Besides that, come back for more Game of Thrones videos, Star Wars videos, comic videos, and more.